Good morning, everyone. Hope you've been Hi. having a good day so far. My name is Hello. Leanne Huang. I'm a student at the New School. Um, I'm a student at the New School, and I'll be your moderator for this panel today. So joining us today is Anna Brandberg, a senior UX designer at King. Linda McDonald, a senior UX designer, uh, a freelance UX designer, and Coralie Rosario, a senior UX designer at Niantic. Um, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A anytime. Um, to start off, we'll, we can have each panelist give a short overview of your journey, like where did you study, and a short run through of your work history. Should I start? Go ahead. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Anna. Uh, I um, I work as a senior UX designer at King. I'm currently working on Candy Crush Saga, and um, it's wild, I guess, to be now working on a game that basically everyone and their mother has played, and to be like to live in a reality where you step on the train. Well, I guess not anymore because of COVID, but before the plague happened, um, to step on the train and see people playing your game. Basically every week you get to see people in the wild. So that's, that's super cool. Um, and I, um, I started off as a graphic designer um, back, back in the day. That was my first job. I started off in board games and um, then realized I liked I wanted to do interactive work with games. So um, applied for a job at EA and then started off as a UI artist uh, in uh, in working in like game dev as we know it. And then had a bit of a transition into a bit of a, a hybrid UI UX role and then moved into solely UX nowadays. And oh, and I forgot to answer the study. So I studied uh, graphic, I got a bachelor's of graphic design at university. So um, I think it was called a um, design and visual communication. So yeah, that's my TLDR. I guess I can go next. Um, I actually have the exact same title degree. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I got, um, about, I think, six years ago now I graduated. I had kind of a weird um, path to UI, UX design in the games industry because I graduated in Ireland and I realized pretty much immediately that there was no game jobs. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? So I just did what was obvious, which was like going to advertising, which I did for like two years. And I started freelancing doing UI outside of my normal job. And eventually I kind of realized like, if I want to do this, I'm going to have to leave and go to a country where I can get like a full-time job doing UI. So I left Ireland after I think about two years of working in advertising and I came to Malta where I live now. And I started working with an indie mobile game developer as a UI designer. And I actually had quite a lot of experience because of all the freelance work I'd done, but it was still my first full-time UI role. So I learned so much from it and I was just so happy to get it. After about a year and a half, I decided to leave because I know it's probably really strange for a lot of people, but I always just wanted to freelance. Like I wanted the freedom and I wanted to choose my own projects. And for me, it was just always like the end goal. So I think in like 2019 or so I started freelancing and I've been freelancing ever since. And I've gotten to work with some really amazing brands over the last few years. So it's been a really kind of weird journey, but I got there in the end. Yes. I don't think that's weird at all. I think that's great. Um, I guess I'll go next or last. Um, so it's really interesting to hear Anna and Linda's journey because mine is so similar and I feel so validated right now. Um, so same, I'm from Puerto Rico originally. I was born and raised here. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in graphic design, specifically they called it like image and design, but it's, it's the same thing. And I worked in print for many, many years and photography as well uh, for many years. Um, around 2012, I moved to San Francisco and I got a master's degree in video game development, specifically with a focus on uh, UI UX. Like that's, that's, I knew that like my skills from graphic design would translate over and I talked with like our director and everything to see if they could like kind of cobble a curriculum together for me. And, and, and that's how 
I, I kind of got my foot in the door a little bit into the into the the discipline. Um, but same like here in Puerto Rico, there was like no opportunities. Um, even in graphic design, it was pretty shaky too. So my only option was really to to leave. And in, in, at that time, um, I've been working in the game industry for about eight years now. Um, I started in UI and then moved into UX. And I've been a UX designer exclusively for, I want to say my, my last three jobs or four jobs. Um, right now I'm at Niantic and I mean, I, I love everything I do every single day. I love working really closely with our game designers. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that I could like say, but, but yeah. Thank you. It's, it's been a really pleasure to be here. It's been really inspiring to hear all your journeys personally. Um, I am currently majoring in communication design myself. I'm also aspiring UX UI designer. Um, can you give an overview of what being a UX or a UI designer means? Like what exactly do you do? What are your responsibilities? Um, and like, what is a typical day in your job like? Or is there anything about your job that people wouldn't expect? Does someone else want to begin? Linda, you can go, go, go for it. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, my job, I think, is going to be like my day is probably very different from both of you guys because I'm freelance. It's not the same. Like I worked in a studio and I know that it is very different. Like for me, the projects I tend to take usually are about three months long max. I do have some like longer projects that I've done. So every three months, my day kind of changes drastically depending on like the genre of the game and like what platforms we're targeting. But usually how uh, my pro the the whole role starts for me is I start with the game design document and I'll have like at least a few weeks where I'm just making the UX from that, talking to the programmers, talking to the game designer. So it kind of goes in phases and, and then it, we start moving in from UX to like prototyping and testing and then eventually the UI. So my day really varies a lot depending on what point I'm at in the project. And then of course, like when, when I'm in between projects or I'm starting a new project, I do a lot of like interviewing with potential clients. So those days for me are like totally different than my normal work day because it's like a lot of back and forth on the phone, reading the game design document, asking tons of questions. Like sometimes I'm writing like almost a thesis of questions about their game design document before I decide if I want to work on it or not. All right. Yeah, well, I can jump in after that. Um, mm -hmm. My day at my in my previous role um at ea that was it was very structured when i had a, a hybrid ui and ux role and um because we were a much smaller team so we were all responsible for every single release that was made um i was on the sims first and then i was on Need for speed and it was like the sims was a little bit of a bigger team at its absolute biggest we were maybe 50 people and with that i'm including like community managers and everything as well but like the actual um like the development team was was smaller um and so we were all responsible for every single update so for that i had a very structured like set so every six weeks every six weekly like we had a cadence of um six week periods where you know we would take into account our pre-production and then doing, um, you know, going through the briefs of like what the designers and um, and like my leads and their producers had already kind of prepped as part of the pre-prod. Um, and so my job there was more uh, like doing initial wireframes and flows for, for each feature. And then once that was all done, I would start um, building the layouts in our engine um and then hand it all over to code and then code would do their like sorcery that they do to make everything function and then um during that period i would uh, put my ui artist hat on and start doing all the like the icons and assets and all of that kind of stuff and then um it would be a period of bug fixing and polish and all of that before then it ships off and we repeat the cycle every six weeks uh currently on candy it's a way bigger team so I don't know exactly how many total we are, but it's like a couple hundred, maybe like 200. I don't know exactly how many, um, but it's a much bigger team and we work in smaller pods. And so um, as a UX designer, I sit in a, a pre-production pod. Um, so I don't actually do any of the, like the production, like the hands-on production part. 
um, I'm I'm in a team that I think like what's the word like caters to a bunch of different production teams, um, and so my day consists of. I mean, it varies obviously, but depending on what the project is, um, it'll be doing, uh, working with our UX researchers to get um, user research, player research about features that we're developing, um, and then taking the briefs from our uh, producers and designers and all of that, take, you know, combining their business, like business needs, and then combining that with our player needs, and then trying to develop features or um, maybe rehauling existing features because it's a game that's been around for so long. Um, and trying to like keep it exciting and fresh because that's that's the tricky thing when you're working on a game that's been around for so long is how do we keep it um, exciting still uh, and engaging for people who've been playing it for eight years and um, what are the kind of ways in which people um, play nowadays because the way that we interact with games and play games has has changed a lot in the past eight years um, and the kind of mechanisms and conventions and things that people expect from games has changed a lot as well. So, um, so we do a lot of that work and then I can sit, either I can be on a project for a couple of weeks just, uh, or I can be, so currently I've just finished off a project that I've been on for five months, I think. So yeah, so that, that's been five months working on one feature. Um, and then now, yeah, we've just finished off a handover period. Well, not handover, I'm still there and accessible and um, available for, for help. But there's an, an, a non-handover handover period where we don't hand it over to the production teams, but we hand over some kind of information to the production teams with, um, this is what the feature is going to look like. These are the uh, the needs for the players, like, you know, your business needs, your player needs, all of that. These um, are um, the specs and, um, and then be available. So when if they have any questions as stuff is being developed, then uh, even though I'm technically working on something else now, I can sometimes be juggling four different things, three or four different things, because I'm managing um, like doing pre-prod, like pre-advance information to the um, the team leads. So like the the people on the on the top of the kind of business making decision making. Um, a hierarchy I hate that word but you get what I mean like the people making the big decisions for like what the future of candy is going to entail so um, providing input for those projects before they uh, land on my plate simultaneously as I'm handling the projects that we're busy developing now and then also um, providing um, support for the the features that I've already um, like handed over to production teams so yeah every day is completely different that was a lot of words. That's really interesting. <laughs> um, so for me, it's it's almost kind of a mix between what Linda and, and Anna are doing. Um, so I'm working, uh, the project that I'm working on right now, it's unannounced and it's still in, in kind of like it's early phases. Um, so it's definitely something that's not out, not live ops or anything. Um, I'm currently co-lead for our UI UX pod. So I do manage alongside another engineer um, about seven people total, including other engineers, our UI designers, um, alongside a producer, and then myself. I'm the only UX designer on our team, uh, specifically, and then one of two at the LA office. Um, so my days typically look like a lot of meetings, just meetings all day. And I sync a lot with our game designers to understand the features that we're, we're building, uh, right now, the phase that we're at, we're tackling multiple features at the same time because we're just building out the core loop for the game. Um, so, you know, in the morning I'll have a meeting about something else versus uh, the next hour we'll be talking about something completely different. Um, sometimes I'll actually be writing GDDs and specs, uh, but deliverables wise, it's the same thing. It's still uh, flow charts, user stories, a um, little bit of user journeys, uh, wireframes, low fidelity prototypes. If I have to create like a storyboard or some sort of like animated mock, I'll do that. Um, if if I have to do like a GIF to just kind of communicate something and a way that should like behave or interact, I'll do that. Um, I'm constantly syncing with my UI designers and the art team, um, as well as the engineers as well. Uh, yeah, like it's 
I'm almost kind of like a bridge between multiple disciplines and making sure that we can actually build the thing that, that we're saying we're going to build. Um, aside from that, I also either do testing directly or I work with our marketed, marketing team to, to then work with like a, some sort of third party company to go ahead and do other types of testing. Um, I, I make sure like all features are are on well on track or or at least being built the way that we we feel should be built um but if i were to say like well what's the difference between you as a ux designer versus you as um uh, versus a game designer um our game designers like are just very focused on the features and what it is that they'll they'll bring forward to the game Whereas, whereas me, I am the one that's introducing and making sure that the player is being heard and advocated for. So every time we, we talk about a feature, um, I'm always looking at it through a lens of, well, as a player or as the personas we've identified or, or the player uh, types that we've identified that are gonna enjoy our game or want to engage with these, um, with these features, this is what they would be expecting from a motivational standpoint, from a behavior psychology standpoint, all this stuff. And sometimes I'll even do workshops if I have to with my team um, to make sure that that player is being heard. And, and obviously through testing, we validate all of this. Uh, the other thing that I'm also really involved with uh, from the UX side is process. Um, so making sure that the process that we're having, we're, we're moving forward with the entire team is one that makes sense for, for the, phase that we're at for what we're building and, and, and for just the discipline as a whole. Um, so a, a lot of the work that I do is more lead work, but I am just constantly talking to everybody all day, all the time. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun and a lot of problem solving. Um, if, if that's one skill that you pick up from anything with UX, it's you're constantly problem solving. I just noticed that the sunset is coming in through my window, so I'm just going to close these things. Um, that actually leads right into our next question. So obviously, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen between you and the client, you and your team, as well as you and the user. So what skills would someone need to be successful in your job? And are there any software programs you use in the workplace? Yeah, I actually saw a question in chat. I've, I've been trying to keep a, a little bit of an eye on chat at the same time. Um, someone asking, oh, so UX designers don't code. Um, and I guess you can, like, if you happen to be a unicorn that can code as well, you're going to be, you're always going to have work. Um, so that's a great thing if you happen to have the kind of brain that is good at both. Um, but generally speaking, no, it's not a requirement to, to know how to code. Um, I have not touched code ever. I can't, I can't script to save my life. Um, and um, it's not a requirement. We often sit in uh, design software. So um, it'll be a mixture of uh, Adobe XD or Figma. I'm, I was a massive Adobe XD advocate. I'm slowly moving over to Figma now. Um, so there's that, but like no, yeah, none of them are better than the other. So don't think that like, oh, I have to know it, it, Adobe XD because it's Adobe, or like I have to use Figma because these people use Figma. Um, like there's Envision, like there's so many different kinds of prototyping software. And generally speaking, they're all pretty good. So um, it depends on what your team's requirements are. Like, do you need to, to provide um, you know, entire flows in the same in the same software that you create your your uh, wireframes in. Then you know, there's like every every app has their every software has their um, limitations and their um, like assets. So yeah, just don't stress too much about that. But generally, it'll be um, mostly prototyping software. Uh, I may hop into Illustrator if like if there's something particular that I need, but I don't even do that anymore. Like I may do some some mock-ups of things in Photoshop if like if need be, but generally I don't even do that anymore. When I did a hybrid, 
UX and UI role, then yes, as a UI designer, I was in Illustrator, Photoshop, doing all of those things all the time because I was doing, like Coralie said, I was doing a lot of like art, uh, UI art, 2D art. Um, but nowadays, as a as a UX designer, it's more about um, looking at yeah, as as you've already spoken about so the the motivations, the um, the goal setting. How does the the feature work? So the work now is more about. Um, from the beginning of our feature, like when the player first loads in up until the moment they're, they've completed the game or completed their gaming session for that day, what does that look like? How many clicks does it take to get from A to B? Is it intuitive? Um, where do we place the information? How do we categorize the information? Um, if the player is able to, to like, not even just reach their goals, even before that, like, do they know what their goals are? What does the player want to do? Um, does the player know what their next objective is? Um, so like putting all that, organizing all that in, uh, in our little like 2D space um, in a cohesive way. And then also things like, you know, your interactions. Am I able to reach the important buttons? Where do we place things? Because the way that you design for a, a PC is going to be very different to how you design for a phone. Um, because on a PC, you're going to be expecting your player to be sitting with like headphones on and they're completely immersed in their gaming session for four hours. Uh, whereas when you're designing for a portable device, where do you expect your player to be playing? Most likely on, you know, on the train or um, on the couch in front of the TV or on the bathroom, uh, in the bathroom. Um, so like you're expecting five to 10 minute gaming sessions, generally speaking, they're often distracted because like, is this my stop? Do I need to jump off at any moment? Um, so like the way that you design gaming sessions for portable devices is going to be very different. Um, so a UX designer will take those things into consideration as well. So it's not, yeah, to to answer a bit about the the confusion of, uh, not confusion, but just like the uncertainty of the difference between UI and UX. Um, I've already forgotten the rest of the question. Someone else can take over. I think you covered it. Um, I can, I can go next if that's okay, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, very much like what Anna was saying, I haven't coded in like six years, something like that. And all the work I do is usually in prototyping uh, software or platforms. Um, I never really work in Unity directly just because the nature of our work has to be incredibly agile. Uh, we have to pump things out very quickly and then iterate on it and validate on it very quickly. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, at least the way we handle our process, to put something in game unless we're fairly certain that what it is that we're building is is actually going to work. Um, we don't want to tie up our engineers into into that implementation phase. Um, but yeah, I, I so technical skill wise, um, I work in Adobe XD right now. However, I'm, I'm slowly moving over to either Figma or or a couple of other ones that, that we were looking at. Um, in the past, I've used Azure, I've used Proto.io. Um, I've also used the entire Adobe suite, like whatever works. Really the purpose is to make sure that you're able to communicate what it is, uh, how this feature is supposed to um, flow and function and everything. Um, if you're able to do that, even in like whiteboarding sessions and that works for your team, then awesome. But I guess that would be like a really great soft skill to emphasize, like knowing how to communicate with your team effectively and understanding what it is that they need specifically um, in order to be able to tell them what we need to build. So, and, and what I mean by that is not everyone is uh, a very visual person or others have to be like super, super visual. I've worked with people that they can't make heads or tails of white uh, gray boxing, like my wireframes. They just can't envision what that that gray boxing is going to ultimately be. So I've had to leverage other ways to present the information, uh, either through a prototype or something, to let them understand the feel of, of what it is that we're building and then move from there. And, and that seems to work. With others, um, I they only understand things if if we like move it into more like the UI phase and, and have something like very almost very polished before they can like give a thumbs up or thumbs down to that. Um, but yeah, technical skills, don't worry about coding. I mean, every company is different. 
And like Anna said, like if you know coding, that's going to be a plus for you. But in games, it's not super necessary from in my experience. Um, in fact, I would say testing would be a little more uh, to your advantage, like knowing how to effectively run user tests. Um, soft Absolutely. skills, yeah. Uh, soft skills, I would say number one, um, and this is something you can build, and and others might might disagree. I do believe empathy can be built up and being able to advocate uh, is something that you should be able to practice and build up. Um, I already mentioned like being able to communicate with your team and collaborate effectively with your team. And as a UX designer, you are literally like, like I mentioned before, you are interacting with so many departments that you need to be able to understand how to speak those departments languages. So it's super important as a UX designer for you to understand the entire game development pipeline and and how to speak you know the same language as your engineers and why we can't build it that certain way and try to understand the infrastructure even if, if it's a little bit um, or the tool sets that we're using even if it's just a little bit and being able to talk to your product managers and from your stakeholder standpoint, like why we can't do or we want to do certain things and being able to communicate and speak that same language as well. Same thing with your artists, same thing with uh, your your game designers. You have to be a little multilingual uh, lingual a little bit there. Um, yeah. It's like I always yeah. refer to us as the spider in the web yeah. because we are the ones that kind of hold the, the bigger picture for, for everyone. We take all the information from all the different things and then we hand it over to different teams as well. So we are the spider in the web. Yeah. Um, uh, Steven was, asks, go for it. Oh, sorry, Steven asked, asked uh, actually a good question. I think it's based off of what I just said. Um, sometimes, like sometimes I do have to, so he's asking, do you, uh, do you find yourself drawn into filling cross-functional duties beyond just communication? Uh, sometimes, sometimes I have to play producer. Uh, other times I have to play game designer. Um, and it's just depending on your team and what the needs are and multiple hats that you have to wear, especially within games. Uh, other companies are a little more structured, uh, but it, again, it just depends the size of your team. Our team, we're about 60 people, so a lot of people sometimes have to wear multiple hats for what it is that we're building. But, but usually it does come back to, I am a UX designer, and these are the things I have to mainly focus on when I am building things out. Um, but yeah, that is me, Linda. <laughs> cool. Um... I don't code in my job at all, but I do know how to code really badly. And I feel like just knowing the, the logical concepts behind coding makes it a lot easier to speak to the coders. But I don't think it's actually a necessary part of the job. It just makes your life a little bit easier, I think. Um, I've also I've been in Figma for a long time now. I think I was in Sketch for a little bit before that because a client I was working with had all their files in Sketch. And I was like, OK, I guess we're using Sketch now. Um, I mean, my job, like because I'm working more so with uh, indie and small studios, I'm definitely more UI on a day-to-day -day basis than UX, the way you guys are doing all the testing and stuff like that. Usually the smaller and the indie studios, they're not putting as much money into that because like the UI needs to be done more than the UX in a lot of cases, or that's the decision that they make. So for me, like I'm in Photoshop most of the time, um, unless we need vector UI for whatever reason, then it's Illustrator. Um, I think as well, like one skill that you need to learn that people don't talk about is actually exporting the UI correctly. Because when you start doing it first and you, you, you know, when you know that you know Photoshop, but then you start exporting the UI, there's all these little weird things that you're like, why isn't it working? And if you don't have someone to teach you how to do that, it's actually a bit tricky, I think. Like I was really lucky that I had an art director who knew how to export. And so he taught me how to do all those little kind of tricks to make everything work. Um, but I do feel like that's a little, skill that people don't really talk about and sometimes it kind of goes like forgotten about for newer designers um another really important skill i think is color theory because when you're designing ui the color of the buttons and like how are you going to indicate things and like sometimes colors can be really hard on the eye like you shouldn't have them as the background color or whatever and i feel like that's something that can be overlooked a little bit as well because you have to learn that pretty early on or else your ui is sometimes just won't feel good to use and you might not figure out why but a lot of times it can be like color combinations or 
the button colors can be wrong, which is kind of going back into UX a little bit with the color choices. Um, for soft skills, I feel like obviously problem solving, even if you're doing just UI, a lot of the time that can come into play. Um, and in general, like problem solving with, within a, a group, because a lot of the times you're actually trying to solve a problem that might exist in programming using your assets or like in, it's not usually just your problem. It's usually a team problem or a group problem within the company. So communicating that and not being like aggressive about your standpoint or whatever, I think it's really important. And sometimes as well, because everybody's super passionate about what they do, people can take a stance and not want to move from it. So I think that's a really good soft skill to have to be able to like communicate with everybody and get the project moving, even when it's difficult. Uh, Linda, I'm, I'm really, oh, I'm sorry. I'm really glad you talked about color theory. Uh, specifically, part of UX is making sure that what you're building is accessible and you're keeping accessibility mm -hmm. in mind. Uh, usually the first thing we go to is like, you know, the colors that we're choosing. Is it good for folks that are like colorblind or, or have some sort of visual impairment? Like that is like foundational, like the first thing you should be thinking of. You don't want yeah. everything that's on screen to look like it's the same color or the same type, uh, the same hierarchy on it. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, and this is something that we like that we still screw up on regularly. So don't beat yourself up if you happen to forget stuff. I mean, like we had a project where I realized this literally, I think it was like a week before we were meant to submit everything and, and send it all off um, where I realized, oh my God, I forgot to like check off on, uh, on color blindness. And we had to change a whole bunch of the assets yeah. in the very last minute um, because nobody remembered. So like have a checklist. I know it's because I went back to my checklist and I was like, oh my God, I forgot this thing. So have a checklist of all these things that you check off all the time. Uh, something that I include, um, not, not anymore as much now that I don't do UI, but I always try to ensure that any uh, thing that we're working on, that we have a, a UI style guide uh, for each thing so that you have like, you know, you um, have your primary colors, your complement co complementary colors, and that you, um, you also uh, kind of, you outline things like, where do our buttons sit? You know, what, um, what are our conventions? How do we attach information to things? So how do we have a visual hierarchy? How do we bring focus onto like the most important thing on our screen uh, so that other things are secondary? Um, and this is, I mean, this overlaps a lot with UX work because that's what we do when we, when we do our um, wireframes is, you know, what is the most important information that we want people to look at first? What is the, the hierarchy of um, what we want people to do second and third and fourth, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, definitely have a style guide. Um, and I guess in relation to that, something that Coralie mentioned, am I pronounced, I can't like, Am I pronouncing it correctly? Cool. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't butchering your name. Um, so uh, about drawing, um, one of the technical skills as a UI artist, it's generally a good idea to be able to draw at least digitally to be able to, to create your assets. Um, as a UX designer, you don't need to be good at drawing. Like I struggle to draw a stick figure to save my life. So um, don't worry about being good at art. In fact, I usually tell people that it's when you're doing your uh, your sketches and your early wireframes and things. In fact, it's good to not be good at art. Like it's good to be bad at art because you want your um, your initial sketches and prototypes to be um, as simple as possible. Uh, because when you present this to your stakeholders, you don't want them to be focusing on like, why is that button green? You know, I feel like it should be purple or why is this asset, you know, that shiny? I feel like it should be less shiny or whatever. And you're standing there going, that's literally not the point. The point is, is this placement fine? Like you want people to be focusing on the the actual like function of, of your screen. Um, so it's good to not make things too pretty because then people start focusing on the pretty things because um, we do that we like pretty you know if you see something that's shiny of course you're going to look at shiny that's how games work um, so yeah uh, the other thing I was gonna uh, that I wrote down that um, that you'd mentioned as well that I thought was super important was the the empathy thing um, as a UX designer that's that's your core trait as a UX designer your job literally 
is to be an advocate for the people who are not able to be in the in the game development environment. You are the player's advocate. Um, and something that's really important to remind people, especially, I guess, when you're working on indie projects, because people are super passionate about their things, because everyone's making their dream game, is this game is not made for you. I know that this is your little, like, baby, but you're not the target demographic. Some this We're developing this game for other people to play. As a UX designer, part of your job exactly. is to look at your segmentation and know what is, like, who is our target demographic and is what we're designing hitting those needs for those people? And it's your job as well to hold your team accountable for that um, because it doesn't matter, like, what you personally want. If you're designing a game that's made for someone from a completely different um, either demographic, but also segmentation. And by segmentation, I mean um, the type of player. So different companies will have different segmentations. Google has all of this. I can't remember the names off the top of my head. Crowley will probably be able to tell you those. Um, but you've got like people who like um, world builder games. Uh, you've got people who like competitive games. You like people who like puzzle games. So there's different types of player categories. Um, and so if you're not part of that segment, it doesn't matter how passionate you are about your dream game. Like you're not the target demographic and you need to remember that you're designing for other people. And as a UX designer, it's your job to unfortunately sometimes trample on someone's dreams a little bit because the designer maybe has written this great elaborate thing and it's like super amazing world and you know, got all the backstories and then you go, yeah, but that doesn't fit what our game is meant to be like it's it's completely derailing the the purpose or the style of our game like this is our segment uh, segmentation this is what we need to be building and we need to align ourselves onto that so um so yeah being empathetic towards a group of people that is not you and being able to communicate that with your team and being able to have those difficult conversations in a constructive way and um bringing like aligning people onto a, a like cohesive vision because you're the one putting together all the wireframes and the prototypes you're the one who kind of brings it all together and um and like Coralie was saying like you're speaking everyone's different languages and it's your job to make sure that everyone speaks the same language and then you know looks at these prototypes and goes cool I understand that I know what we're building we have around three more minutes left, so I'm just going to ask some questions in the chat really quick. Um, this one is more for Anna, says, from Doris, what sims have you worked on? Uh, the sims free play on mobile. Free play. Nice. Yeah. Um, Anthony asks, what is your favorite cognitive bias? Anybody can answer this. Ooh. I feel, hmm, I'm going to sit on this one. Also, I've talked too much already. I'll jump in with something once I figure something out. Yeah, there is just there's so many of them. <laughs> yeah, there's so, so many of them. Um, I'm going to have to think on this one, too. I actually have to look them up because there are like so many of them. Something, by the way, this is not answering the question, but I just had a, a thought, something else. When you mentioned I'm going to look them up, there's something else that you can look up. That's a great resource because um, we were talking about accessibility things before. Um, Able Gamers has a, a list of design conventions or like, I don't remember what the name is, but like rules, I guess, um, that anyone developing games should be taking into consideration to make sure that games are accessible by everyone because games should be for everyone. So um, making sure that your game isn't unintentionally include, dis excluding people. Um, so that is probably a good thing for people to look up. I can. Oh, thanks, Maggie. I was just about to drop it into the chat, but Maggie handled that. In regards to cognitive biases, it's I don't remember what it's specifically called, but it's the one that I see come up the most often. It's um, kind of seeing patterns when there really isn't like any sort of correlation going on in there or and people thinking that there is something there because of the pattern that they're noticing or incorrectly um incorrectly understanding that pattern um we see that a lot in testing specifically like 
people will come to their own interpretation based on like what multiple people are saying and then try to act upon it immediately and change something in the game just because maybe three of our uh, testers or participants like said the same thing. But as a UX designer, you have to like kind of like dig in a little bit deeper in there and, and kind of poke and prod a little bit to find out really specifically the why behind each of each of those, um, maybe it's clustering illusion, I, I don't remember, um, the why behind why that pattern is showing up. And it's not always going to be like the first thing we think about. Um, again, not my fa it's not necessarily my favorite, but it is really like something that appears all the time. And I have to like tell my team on previous teams as well, like, let's let's sit down for a little bit and let's like stew on this and try to find out more information before we we jump into problem solving immediately all right we're unfortunately out of time so we're gonna have to wrap this up thank you everybody for coming okay.